No other king could vanquish the war horse or silence the warrior's rage while riding the lowly back of a donkey. No other king could break the dominion of darkness, the tyranny of evil, with a reign of grace and a kingdom of peace. No other king could give his life for the redemption of rebels, his wealth to welcome the outcast. Jesus is that king, the king of glory, son of the living God. Not just another king, not just another prophet, not just another teacher. He was the one the world had been waiting for. The one to deliver us from captivity, the son of David and Abraham's chosen seed. He is the goal of the Mosaic law, Yahweh in the flesh. He is the one to establish God's reign and rule, to heal the sick, give sight to the blind, freedom to the prisoners, and proclaim good news to the poor. This Jesus was the creator come to earth and the beginning of a new creation. He embodied the covenant, fulfilled the commandments, and reversed the curse. This Jesus is the Christ that God spoke of to the serpent, the one prefigured to Noah in the flood, the one promised to Abraham, the one guaranteed to Moses before he died, the one promised to David during his reign, the one revealed to Isaiah as a suffering servant, the one predicted through the prophets and prepared for through John the Baptist. He is the Father's Son, Savior of the world, and substitute for our sins. More loving, more holy, and more wonderfully terrifying than we ever thought possible. He is our Jesus, and there is no other king like him. He is our God, our glory, our victorious Savior. There is no other king like him. There is no other king. There is no other king like Jesus. Amen. Let's stand together. This is Easter morning, and we are welcoming you here this morning. We are so happy you've joined us. We, uh, we sang a song on Good Friday. If you were here with us on Good Friday, we sang a song, but we didn't finish the song. So this morning... We're going to finish the song. Oh, the rugged cross, my salvation.
side. No witness for his our salvation. Jesus for us, save you die. Sunday or you've come a couple times and you want to get to know MBC more, we have a special little goodie package for you. It's a mug with some goodies and an information package that tells you everything and anything you need to know about the church. It's just at the connect desk to the right outside of the doors here at Celebration Hall. And another really exciting thing is we are giving out Bibles. If you do not have a Bible, if you don't have a copy of the Word of God, we want to give one to you. We think it's really important to hold scripture in your hand so we want to give you a bible if you do not own them they're just on the table in the back and you may have noticed that you don't see as many kids around in the sanctuary today and that's because there is a kids program all sunday long that's right they have a special easter program so if you are in the nursery all into grade six head over to the hub just around the corner and there's a special easter program for you and now i'd like to pray and then we can get right back to worshiping so if you wouldn't mind bowing your heads with me dear heavenly father i just thank you for today i thank you that we get to celebrate the biggest triumph in history god that today is the greatest day in history the day that jesus rose from the grave that he died for our sins, Lord, and that we get to live a life that's dedicated to you, God. I pray that every heart in this room can know the Lord today. I pray that he, they know that he knows every single one of their names and that today is a celebration of who you are. That today is a day that we as Christians get to just glorify you and praise you and point to that's why we celebrate God. This is what he's done for us. I pray that everyone can have an open heart today, that 
that we can worship you, that doesn't matter who's around us, God, but that it's all about you. And it's a day that we can dedicate to you and celebrate you. And that it's something that we think about all year to come, that this is not just one day that we get to celebrate, but we get to celebrate that we have you and that you died for us every single day, Lord. I ask these things in your name. Amen.
I get some clapping for we are washed in the blood of Jesus and we he is risen and we have salvation through the risen Christ today and it's amazing God I'm, I'm just gonna pray God we just thank you so much for the gift of salvation the grace the mercy thank you that you sent your son to die on a cross. We remembered that on Friday. And today we celebrate that he's no longer dead, that he is alive, and we are alive with him. And so we just thank you so much for that. It's, it's Easter morning. God, we just can't help but celebrate and be joyful because of the gift of grace that you gave us. Thank you, Lord. Savior say thy strength indeed is small child of weakness watch and pray find in me thine all in all Jesus paid it
the dirt with you and me. He knows what our living is. He's acquainted with our grief. A man of sorrow, son of suffering. Blood and tears, how can it be? There's a God who weeps. There's a God who bleeds. Oh, praise the one who would reach for me. Hallelujah to the Son of Suffering. So imagine you, the distant and removed, but you chased us down in merciful pursuit. Let's pray together. 
Father, we just come in adoration and praise for the work of your Son in our lives, for the one who gave himself so that we might have life, for the one who suffered and died, the one who was buried for three days, rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, declared glory over death, declared sin beaten, declared the devil destroyed, and Lord, we just come and give thanks, and we just say, thank you, Lord. We give you praise. We give you praise for all that you have done and what you are going to do, what is yet to be done in our lives. And so we just now, Lord, we just say, take this service for your glory and honor. May you be known in this place. May Jesus Christ be lifted up and glorified. The name above all names. The King above all kings. The Lord above all lords. The one who gave himself so that we might have the fullness of life. We praise your name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated if you would. Let's thank the worship team for... Uh, putting this together. <laughs> we've, uh, we've had a great uh, Easter of worship, a Good Friday, as well as today. We've got <clears throat> a number of uh, people sick with COVID and people who are going to be watching online because, you know, they just can't be here. We have staff, uh, the Langfords, the Stricklands, um, you know, all with COVID, and so we've made last-minute changes. These guys have jumped in at the last minute and put all of this together for Good Friday and today, so I'm just, I'm just so thankful. I'm so thankful for them, and we have more to come, so good stuff. Hey, listen, one of the things that we like to do on Easter Sunday is we like to celebrate the new life that is found in Christ. And so we have people who are baptized. We have people who, will, who join membership. And each one of them this morning that does that um, are going to give testimony. And again, we're, but we, our numbers are about cut in half because of COVID again. Um, in fact, you're going to find there's, we're going to have a strange presentation. But uh, one of the things... Um, <clears throat> Uh, one of the things we love to do is to hear God's stories of what God is doing in people's lives because it's such an encouragement. And as well, if perhaps you're looking in and you say, you know, I've never trusted Christ as Savior or I'm far from God. And it's been a long time since I've either been in church or considered the things of God. You know what? When people tell their stories, it's, nobody's faking it. <laughs> This is really what's happening in people's hearts and lives. And I just find it so inspiring and exciting. And I hope you will too. We have one baptismal candidate today. Yes, one baptismal candidate. And so I'm going to call, uh, well, before we do, let me just explain to you what baptism is. Jesus uh, before he ascended into heaven, Matthew chapter 28, he told his disciples, he gave them a commission. He said, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey or observe everything that I've commanded. And thus the church has a commission. We call it the Great Commission. And so what, what we find in that Great Commission is that baptism is associated with discipleship. And so when someone becomes a disciple of Christ, accepts Christ as Savior, there comes a time in their life when they're convinced that they need to be baptized. Now, why be baptized? Why be baptized? Well, baptism does two things. Baptism proclaims faith. We proclaim our faith through baptism, but baptism is also a picture. So let me explain. First of all, it's a profession of faith. When we, um, when we are, are, are baptized, we're basically saying that we're on Jesus' team, that we've trusted Jesus as Savior. We're identifying with Jesus. It's kind of like our dear, sad, sorry raptors last night. 
you put on a Raptors uniform and you say, this is my team. This is my team. I identify with we the North. When you become baptized, what you are doing, you are po- proclaiming, I'm on Jesus' team. I believe in what he's done for me, and I'm proclaiming, I'm professing that he is my king, he is my God. And so it's a proclamation of faith. The other thing is, it's a picture. It's a picture. You see, Jesus Christ died on the cross. He bore our sin. Then he was buried for three days. And after three days, he came up out of that grave into new life. And what we are doing when we are baptizing people, we're saying, here's the picture. Here's the picture. And I always like to feel the water before we do baptisms. (laughs) Sometimes it's like a hot tub, and sometimes it's like Lake Erie in January. And, uh, well, actually, that's just about perfect. So what happens, uh, Nolan Cochran is about to be baptized. Yeah. And what's going to happen is he's going to stand here, a picture of Christ and his death on the cross. He's going to go down into the water, fully immersed underwater, symbolizing the death that Christ died. And then three days later, we're going to bring him up. No, no, just kidding. (laughs) Not even three minutes, we promise. (laughs) But we are going to put him right under. And (laughs) we're going to bring him up. And it's a picture of the new life that we have in Christ. The new life that we have in Christ. And it's, it's just a picture of what Christ has done for us. And it's why the apostle said, he, you know, he said, I identify with that. He said, for I've been crucified with Christ so that it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. This new life I have is in Jesus. So it's a, baptism is a beautiful thing for a disciple to do. Um, to both profess Christ and to show the picture of what Christ has done. So I am going to invite Nolan Cochran up. I'm also going to invite his father, Terry Cochran, to come as well. And Tori Pitum is going to come too. So why don't the three of you come? We have, it's kind of a very unusual thing that's happening in that we have three members, basically, of the same family. <laughs> so here, why don't you come up there, Nolan? And what's happened is, because of you know my bad bum knee, um, uh, these guys are gonna help me. And Tori, of course, many of you know, she's our youth director at Milton Bible Church. And so I'm just so excited. This is her first baptism, so woo <laughs> And when we asked Nolan, um, who would you like to assist, Tori? Um, Nolan said, I'd like my father to assist. I, I just think that's absolutely beautiful. Now, some of you may or may not know, but in June, Tori becomes a Cochrane. And so, <laughs> so this is, all, it's, we've never had this before. <laughs> It's all in the family, and frankly, I love it. It's absolutely beautiful. Nolan, thank you for sharing a testimony with us. I'm going to stop talking, and I'm going to definitely let you uh, go ahead. So go ahead, brother. Good morning, everyone. My name is Nolan Cochran, and I want to share with you why I want to be baptized. I grew up in a Christian home, and I don't remember a time when I did not trust and love Christ. I was five when my mom and I prayed together for Jesus to come into my heart. I want to be baptized to publicly declare Jesus lives in my heart, and I want to follow in his footsteps. Jesus is truly the best person. He showed me how to love others as he loves me. A few Bible verses I would like to share with you are Psalms 139, 7 to 11. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the furthest ocean, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. The next verse is John 6, verse 27. 
But don't be so concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. For God the Father has given me the seal of his approval. Thank you. Good job, buddy. job Cochran's <laughs> all right praise the Lord we now have some people who are going to come into membership at Milton Bible Church and um, I'm going to call uh, the Ortiz family Brian and Yolanda and their two children uh, Brian jr. and Joshua David will come as well and they're going to share a word of testimony and uh, afterward there we're going to vote and um, in a very affirmative way, um, and they're going to uh, join us formally as church members. So, okay. Sorry, Doug. I'm just gonna go ahead. I want to stand up with you. Go ahead. So, good morning, everybody. Um, I practice this so much. Pastor already introduced my family, but I got to do it. <laughs> So um, we're a family of four. We're a Spanish family. My husband, Brian, my little guy, Brian Ortiz, and my five-month-old, Joshua. And we are amazingly happy to be here. And of course, we are loving this church more because, of course, like we never got breakfast in my other church, so <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> and me, myself, so I'm going to start. Um, so my name is Yolanda Ortiz. I was born in the capital of Guatemala City. Um, some people don't know, it's like, where's Guatemala? It's close to Mexico, El Salvador, and Honduras. Um, this is where I grew up with my eight siblings. I'm the smallest one of the bunch, so I'm the last one. I lived in a home where we only had a mom to look up to, as due to the poverty of my country, my father, who I had never met before, uh, came to Canada to find a better life for him, for, um, a better life for us later on, obviously. Um, so I remember clearly that um, while I was uh, back home, um, my friends, my neighbors were um, going to a place. At that time, I had no idea where they were going. Um, so my little friend was coming out of her house and um, I told her, where are you guys going? And then she said, uh, we're going to church. And I'm like, oh, okay. And I said, can I come? Obviously, we as kids, we cannot just say, you know, can I come and then go. So we plotted a plan for her to tell her mom, to tell my mom, that I wanted to go without my mom finding out that I was the one to tell her that I wanted to go. <laughs> so it worked out perfectly because I ended up going, and that was the first time I ever stepped my feet in a Christian Spanish church back home. So after that moment in my life at 10 years of age, I knew God was going to be part of my life forever. Um, at the age of 11, we got the news um, that we got the papers to come to Canada and um, that they were accepted. And I was super excited and nervous at the same time because that was the first time I was going to meet my father because he came to Canada when I was just one year old. And that was the first time I ever talked to God and I prayed to him because of the nervousness that I had. And I remember the ladies when I went to that church, how they prayed and I was just praying. I don't know if I'm doing this right, but I'm nervous. I'm gonna meet my dad and I am so happy at the same time. So when I arrived in Canada in 1998, my old sister who was living here in Canada already was going to a Spanish Christian church. I was so excited and told her I wanted to go so we, we all, we all went. All of my family ended up going. Um, I started to know Christ by hearing his word, going to Sunday school. I was always curious to know who this Jesus guy was, right? 
All this time, I had pretty good understanding who he was, but never really got to know him until the summer of 2008, where I got the chance to uh, be old enough to go to a youth camp. And um, at that time, I finally had the encounter with the Lord where I was able to hear him speak to me clearly. And he spoke to me through Isaiah 43, 1, that says, but now, this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Yolanda, it says Jacob, but this is how I heard it. <laughs> he who created you, Yolanda, he who formed you, Yolanda, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. This was clear as water, and it confirmed to me what I knew I had felt when I was 10 years old, that I belonged to him, and a few months later, I made the decision to be baptized by immersion in water. And till this day, I can say that he has been true to me, and that even though I have gone through so many trials and tribulations, he still continues to be with me, and he continues to repeatedly tell me that I am his, and that he has called me by name. And God has been my rock in every moment I have faced. To him, I owe my beautiful family. And to him, I owe the fact that I'm here today. And because of that and his amazing grace, I thank him. Thank you. Okay. So like the pastor said, this is going to be a little weird. Um, so I'm going to read my husband's testimony. He's a little shy. He might, he, he <laughs> thinks he's going to mess up a little, so I'm going to help him out a little bit today. <laughs> um, so my name is Brian. <laughs> <laughs> okay. My name is, my name is Brian Ortiz. So it's because of his English. His pronunciations are not, it's not that great, but that's what he says, right? <laughs> So my name is Brian Ortiz. I was born and raised in a Christian family where my parents always implanted in us the fear of God and instructed us in the path of faith. From a very young age, together with my brothers, my parents involved us in music, and at the age of 13, I began to participate in the worship ministry of my church in Chile and was always baptized by emerge, uh, and was ba also baptized by emerging water. As I grew older, I was always participating and serving in my church, but I never made the decision to have an encounter with Christ. I was a Christian. I went to church and believed in God, but throughout all this time, the God I knew was the God of my parents. And for this reason, there were ups and downs in my life where I made many mistakes and bad decisions. I was, the, I was a young man with a double life. At the age of 19, I left my country, Chile, and came to Canada without having a plan, without knowing what was going to happen to me in this country. But God gave me a verse before leaving my country, and that is found in Joshua 1.9. See that I command you to strive and be brave. Do not be afraid of or dismayed, because Jehovah your God will be with you wherever you go. I believed in that verse and clung to it as if it was the lottery ticket. I took the decision to follow Christ and not turn back, to be faithful to him and to seek him from the bottom of my heart. There have been difficult moments, trials and tribulations, where times I want to leave everything and not continue, but the whole Bible tells me that those who decide to follow Christ, that their days will not be easy. Also, Jesus said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and, make up their, and take up their cross and follow me. Also in Acts 11, uh, sorry, in Acts 14.22 says that we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. And in John 16.33, Jesus says, in the, word, in the world you will have tribulations, but trust, I have overcome the world. By faith we believe in his word and his promises, and he also says that he will be with us every day until the end of the world. God has blessed me and prospered my home in the difficult moments of my life. I clung to the verse of Romans 8:28 as well that says, and we know that those who love, the, who love God, all things to work together for good. And so it has been. To this day, I can look back and say, Ebenezer, so far Jehovah has helped me. Thank you. All right. All right. All right. 
thank you guys. Don't go away yet. <clears throat> Don't go away yet. Um, Mary and I had the privilege of visiting with Brian and Yolanda and the boys in their home uh, about a month or so ago and got to hear their story of how they met Christ. And, um, and so uh, we also got to to hear about their love for Milton Bible Church and how they've just really come in very quickly to NBC and become a big part. They love God's word. They love each other. They, they love the church. They're here to serve. And, uh, and they're, they're just one of these wonderful couples. And, you know, Brian, uh, Yolanda kind of kids around that Brian was born in the U.S., grew up in Chile, and can't speak English. And, um, but, the tr- <laughs> but the truth is, his English is wonderful. So please grab these folks, pull them aside, invite them over for dinner. They are absolutely delightful. You'll be privileged to get to know them. And so it's my joy to move that we receive um, the Ortiz's, Brian and Yolanda, into membership at Milton Bible Church. And so I would like to make that motion all of those in members who, uh, um, who would affirm this, would you please raise your hand? All right, very good. Well done. Congratulations, guys, you're in. <laughs> All right, bless you. All right. <laughs> Once again, God is just so amazing in uh, the folks that he's bringing our way um, and uh, from so many different places in the world. Uh, the Lord is bringing the nations to Milton, and we are the richer for it. All right, we have um, another family that are coming in, or another couple that are coming into membership. You may recognize them because of COVID. Um, we, they can't be here today. So they are going to share their testimony by um, video. I hope that's okay. You won't be able to ask them questions. Um, And I'm not sure how the vote will go. But afterwards, uh, Dave Nelson, who one of our elders who had an opportunity to um, visit with them, he's going to come up after the video and he's going to um, bring a motion uh, to bring the folks into membership. And then right after that, Matt Timpson is going to come, another one of our elders, and he's going to continue to do the same with another family. So uh, please, uh, let's cast your eye to the screen and let's enjoy what God has done in the life of this couple. Hey, Milton Bible, it's Mark and Wendy here. We so wish that we could be with you this Easter Sunday. Unfortunately, we've had sickness going through our house, but we are excited to be coming into membership today and we do want to share our testimonies with you. I'm going to turn it over to Wendy. She'll go first. (laughs) Thank you, Mark. Um, Well, I grew up in a Christian family. Um, My dad is a pastor, so we grew up going to church and um, worshiping God from an early age. And my parents taught us very, very much, like as young as we could, that to follow God and to, to really look to him at all times. And I learned very early on that I needed to have Jesus in my life. So I decided that I wanted to ask him into my heart. And I did at a very young age. And then from there, I, you know, you grow up and you go through valleys and and highs. And I I learned how to walk with God. And I'm still learning that day to day. Um, But yeah, that is basically my story. On to you. (laughs) Awesome. Yeah, for me, I also grew up in a Christian household. I was very thankful that my parents uh, loved the Lord and brought us to church each week. But I knew that going to church didn't make me a Christian. And when I was eight years old, I heard the gospel um, at my Christian school. And I went home that day and I prayed on my bed and asked Jesus into my heart. And uh, from that day forward, I've been following the Lord, making recommitments along the way. Um, In high school, I had a couple years of struggle. But by God's grace, uh, he kind of dragged me out of that. And um, it was in that time period that I sensed a calling to vocational ministry. And so a few years after after that point, uh, I met Wendy, and she's been my partner in ministry ever since then. And we've had the joy of serving here at Milton Bible Church in the past, as well as at a couple other churches. But what we're really excited about is uh, the journey ahead, the season ahead, and serving 
once again at Milton Bible in the years to come, seeing all that God has in store for us uh, in this next season. So that's it. That's our testimonies. We're excited to be coming into membership today, and we're hoping that you have a happy Easter. He is risen. He is risen indeed. God bless. Bye. Bye. hope this one works. Is it working? Good, good. Um, yeah, so uh, a couple weeks ago, um, Su Suzanne and I met with Mark and Wendy and their family, and um, I've, I've known Mark's family for, well, his parents and my parents go way, way back, and so I've kind of known the Stricklands for many years, um, but I haven't really, I, and I know, I knew um, Mark's older brother more than I knew Mark, so it's been really um, exciting to get to know him again. We, um, when we started coming to this church, Mark was a was serving in this church actually, and was a, a pastor in this church and a, uh, a youth pastor, and that's one of the reasons why we were kind of attracted to coming to this church in the first place. And so um, it's uh, it's been a long journey of knowing the Strickland family. Uh, we met with them a couple of weeks ago in our f in our home, and I uh, I was I, I walked away from that from that whole afternoon just how. Um, how much they love God, they love each other, and their family loves God, but their family really loves each other as well, and there's a lot of spunk in that family with their kids, and it's just so good to see, and uh, I just, um, I just uh, am so pleased that they have uh, uh, chosen to come to return to MBC, and um, just based on that, I'd just like to um, by a show of hands of members, if uh, all that would be in favor of uh, al allowing them to join a membership here today. Gr great. Oh, that's good. Thank you. Okay, so Mark and Wendy, welcome to membership. <laughs> we're, we're so excited to we're so excited to have them join us again. Thank you. Morning, everybody. Uh, Jacob and Paige, when you guys come on up here, so I'll speak afterwards, but I just want to introduce you to Jacob and Paige Curry. They're going to give their testimonies. You probably know Jake. He's on staff here with us, and he's the face behind the camera. <laughs> come on up, guys. Good morning, everybody. Happy Easter. He is risen. I've only ever said the back side of that from the crowd, so I thought it'd be fun to say it. And Tori got to say it, so I wanted to, too. Um, so I will begin with my testimony first. Um, I grew up in a Christian family. Uh, my parents took, took me to church from as long as I could remember, like nursery, Sunday school, that sort of thing. Uh, the first time I kind of truly remember really, I guess, being conscious and understanding, um, like the word of God and uh, Jesus' sacrifice. I remember we talked about it in Sunday school, and we got these little New Testaments, and I remember bringing one to my friend, who I know didn't go to church, and I was like, I want you to come to heaven too, so you need to read this right now. <laughs> and to this day, I know he still has it. I don't know if he's read it thoroughly. I need to follow up with him on that, but um, that was sort of one of the first moments I really remember uh, understanding the, like, gravity and uh, the sacrifice that Jesus made for me. Um, and so I, I guess that would be kind of one of the times I accepted Jesus into my heart. And I'd say the second real time I really felt that passion was um, later on around 2010. Uh, I started coming here to what is now Momentum. Back then, I forget what it was called, just youth. Um, back when Mark was here, actually, and back when Jordan was an intern and had more hair. Um, so I, I've, been, I've been around MBC for a little while. Um, and it was really there that uh, growing up in youth and being around uh, people and teens uh, around my age with uh, passion for God, met a lot of great friends, and it was a really good time for me to grow in my faith, just to be able to really talk uh, and to converse and to learn more about the Word of God among, you know, peers who are our age as opposed to the big scary adults. It was, it was a good time, and in that time I kind of got involved in our leadership team uh, at youth, and then when I moved away to college it was a little bit uh, different because I kind of lost that whole system, and I was I felt like I kind of left away, but then uh, I met my wife Paige, and, uh, and we had a few other Christian friends in our college program, and so we started going to a church in Oakville, 
And then as we kind of ended our schooling, I was like, hey, uh, there's this great church in Milton. We were kind of looking around to find a church to settle in. And I was like, it was a great church, and I went there as a youth. So I was like, we should go there. And we went here for a couple weeks, and then COVID happened. So we stopped coming, uh, and we started coming online. Um, and so it was in this time of COVID that I really felt uh, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of anxiety about, you know, work, things like that. We're both very much planning people. So we're like, yeah, we did this at school. We did an internship here. We're going to work here, here, here. It's going to be great. And then none of that really happened. Um, but it was in that that God really, uh, I guess, spoke to me. Uh, and there's one verse in particular. I'm going to pull it up because I cannot remember it word for word. Uh, it's Matthew 6:25. Uh, it says, therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is life not more than food and the body more, more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they are? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And so... Living by that is kind of what's got me through these last couple years, I would say. That's been kind of a verse that's really anchored me uh, and really solidified my faith. Um, and here I am now, and had COVID not happened, not that, I mean, I wish it didn't happen, I'm sure we all do, but uh, knowing that God's used that um, time of struggle and of anxiety and stuff to bring me to where I am now, uh, where I can kind of use my, my gifts and my talents to help better the church, uh, I'd say that's been the most worth apart for me. And so that brings us to today. Um, so that's enough from me. I'll introduce you to my lovely wife, Paige, and she can continue on from here. Thank you, Jake. I wrote mine out, so I'm just going to read it. <laughs> I was raised in a household where I was taught about God, and we prayed out holidays like Christmas and Easter, but we never attended church. Throughout my high school years, I went to a youth group with friends where I learned more about Jesus, and through my own research, I felt God reaching out to me and truly calling me into having a deeper relationship with him. During college, I met my now husband, Jake, and we attended a church in Oakville together, as he mentioned. This is where I was baptized and gave my life to Jesus. There was not a specific occasion where I decided to accept Jesus as my savior. Rather, it was something that I was led to and thought about over time, always knowing he was there loving me and protecting me. It was when I began attending church with Jake as a young adult that I was able to truly understand the importance of Jesus' love and sacrifice for me, which ultimately led me to make the decision on my own to get baptized. We began attending MBC right before the pandemic, and as Jake mentioned, he attended youth here as a kid, which is why we started coming. And um, since we began attending, I felt more welcome here than any other church we've tried out before. Jury Despite any anxieties I had, I've felt involved, appreciated, and seen, and for that reason, we feel like MBC has become our home, and we're so excited to continue to grow with you all in life and faith. Keeping it short and sweet today. <laughs> um, I should have written mine down, too. I forgot to say, um, I, right before I went to college, um, at our weekend away, actually, which I'm excited for this summer, um, I did choose to get baptized there to kind of declare my faith. Um, and that was, again, with that uh, youth group there. So I, I forgot to mention that. I really should have written mine down, too. Let's give him a hand. Thank you, guys. All right, thank you. I like the way Jake took this off. You know, he's obviously used to speaking. Um, well, that's great. Thank you very much. Jake just mentioned the weekend away. This year, September 23rd to 25th is our weekend away. So mark it down on your calendars, and we want everyone to be there. There'll be lots more coming about that. Um, thank you guys for your testimonies. That's wonderful to hear. Don and I had the privilege of interviewing Paige and Jake um, here in the church building. We had to find the right time, and it worked out here in the building. So we had a lovely time with that meeting. Um, we really heard their testimonies of their faith in Jesus Christ. That's the most important thing. That's one of the things we ask new members. Will you commit your life to being faithful to Jesus Christ? That's number the first thing then being faithful to the church and supporting the church. Um, we heard about their baptisms, as you just did. They both were baptized by water. Um, so we had a great time. They are really invested and involved in the church. Jake's on staff, but more than that, they're um, helping out with youth group. They're part of the young adults. Um, and it's just been great to see you guys grow in your faith and as part of the church. God, I truly believe, grafts each one of us in. Each one of us is a part of the body that's needed here, and we're so glad to have you guys. So we recommend you guys. You know, I was thinking, we have two staff members, Mark and Jake. If you guys voted no to membership, it would be really awkward, wouldn't it? <laughs> so I'm hoping that's not going to happen. 
So we're going to, uh, I move uh, with Donna that we um, invite Jake, Jacob, and Paige Curry into membership. All in favor? Right hand. Wonderful. Any opposed? You're supposed to ask that? <laughs> no? <laughs> Good. <laughs> All right, wonderful. Thanks. Let's give them another round of applause. <laughs> and now, Pastor Jim DeMars. Ah, thank you. <laughs> woo, 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 woo. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Matt. Well, it's great to be together this Easter Sunday. It's absolutely wonderful. Um, do you know that millions of Christians all over the world are celebrating the greatest event in world history? Do you know when Jesus stepped out of death into life? No other religion can claim such a message. Death is beaten. And there's nothing more important to know that death is beaten. And do you know what? One day we're all going to face death. I turned 63 this week, which means, yeah, but what that means is I'm going to face it a lot sooner than a lot of you guys. And it's wonderful to know that death has been beaten. It's a tremendous joy and delight. Do you know, Easter, it causes us to celebrate because we're not only singing about a Messiah who walked out of a tomb, and we sing those kinds of songs, but we sing because I got out of that tomb. And as the great Easter song says, you called my name, and I ran out of that tomb. Something happened to me that when he rose, something happened to me when I put my faith in Jesus Christ. And so I want to welcome you here this morning. And maybe someone has invited you along and they said, hey, it's Easter. Why don't you come along? Why don't you come to church today? And we're praying that you're going to hear something through the testimony, through the music, through the word, whatever it might be, something that makes you think that makes you say to yourself, hey, you know what? I need to look into this more. I need to take this a little more seriously than I do. I need to look into this tomb thing because you know what? There's nobody there. So what's the story? You know, <clears throat> and I hope you'll say, I'm curious about this. And you know what? This isn't just a religious thing. It's not just a ritual the stories that people are telling about their relationship with Jesus and meeting Jesus, it's real. It's real. I mean, look at the way people sing here, and they love to sing. I mean, they really believe this. So I want you to come, even this morning. Maybe you would come to believe in the truth of the resurrection of Jesus in a way that you never have before. I'm going to read from John's gospel in just a moment where he actually says, the reason I've written these things is that you might come to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life. You know, something happens when you believe it. It's not just like believing that Julius Caesar lived, so Jesus lived. No, believing that Jesus was who he said he was and proved to be makes a huge impact it changes your life. So I'm praying this morning that you get blessed. I'm praying as we go through this story together that something happens in our hearts as we examine this story from John's gospel in chapter 20. It's fascinating to read how the Bible records this phenomenal event. And you know what, if I was going to write this story, I probably wouldn't have written it the way it's written here in John's gospel. I would have told it a little differently because, you know, there's all kinds of witnesses that see things and all kinds of strange things that happen and all kinds of people that say, I don't really understand what's going on here. And that's okay, they're human. We don't always understand what's going on either. But I think, <clears throat> you know, if I had written it, um, I would have probably written it a little differently, a little more straightforward, a little more wonderful, maybe even glorious. But this is what actually happened. So I want to read John chapter 20, verses 1 to 18. So if you have a Bible, 
And if you don't, you can always grab one of those new Bibles from the back. John chapter 20, verses 1 to 18. This is what it says. It says, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark. And she saw that the stone had been rolled away from the tomb. So she ran and went uh, to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Now both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And and stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths there, um, lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and he went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scriptures that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stood to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. And having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And then Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and your God. And so Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord and that he had said these things to her. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let's pray together. Father, I just want to thank you for this word, for the story of Mary Magdalene. Lord, we come to you and we thank you that we're here celebrating that today. Thank you, Lord, for the good news that reached us that someone came to us and they told us that Jesus is alive. And Father, we ask you in the name of Jesus right now to let your spirit come. Come, Holy Spirit, we ask. Open your word so that we might see and we might understand. And take off blinders to give us faith and to help us to see Jesus and who he is in all his fullness and glory. We ask it, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. So here we are. Someone's already said it. We are celebrating the most significant day in world history. Do you know that we number the days according to this event? 2,022 years have slipped by since the world woke up to this reality. Jesus is alive from the dead. It's the most significant day that God broke through into world history. What looked like the end was in fact the beginning. You know, one of the names of Jesus in the New Testament is the beginning. He started everything afresh. He's like another Adam come to start the human race all over again. Jesus, who is our wonderful Savior. And so this morning we're going to look through the eyes of Mary Magdalene. 
She's the one who first gets to see the risen Jesus. It's an extraordinary thing. And you know what? I think if I, I was Jesus, you know, I would have turned up at somebody else's house. I would have gone to Pontius Pilate's house, and I would have knocked on the door, Pilate, hello, I'm back. I would have done something like that, you know, or maybe Herod's house, or Julius Caesar, how about him? But why Mary Magdalene? Why Mary Magdalene? Who's she? I mean, not even Simon Peter, who's kind of chief of the apostles. No, Mary Magdalene. You know, the turn of this story is so real. You know, if Jewish people were going to make this up in the first century, they wouldn't have made it a woman. They would have made it a key guy, which would have been so much more culturally acceptable. But this is the reality. This is how it happened. This is what took place. And this is what was recorded. So who was Mary Magdalene? Who was Mary Magdalene? It's kind of a famous name, isn't it? Well, when Hollywood makes movies about Jesus, they always kind of make her a prostitute. They try to make it all sensuous, all sexual, because that's what they do in Hollywood. Well, in the Bible, it doesn't actually say that. It says in Luke's gospel, again in Mark's, um, and these are other places where we bump into Mary Magdalene, it's from... uh, Mary Magdalene, that seven demons went out. That's what it said. In fact, in Luke's gospel, it says, literally, I'm reading, out of her seven, seven demons went. Now, that's a strange kind of reputation to have. You know, the Bible, it's very specific. When Jesus feeds 5,000, it says that he took five loaves and two fishes. Um, there were 12 apostles. If you read in the next chapter, in, uh, in John 21, verse 11, it says that they went fishing, and they caught 153 large fish. Very specific, because that's what actually happened. The Bible is kind of specific, and here is someone from whom seven demons came. She wasn't just a troubled woman. She wasn't just a promiscuous woman. She had evil powers in her. Seven demons that drove her, her personality, things that troubled her, things that concerned her, things that forced her into stuff that she didn't want to go into. Do you know what the Bible says? That the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. You know, so often I hear people say things like, you know what, I don't believe there is a God because this happened or that happened or terrible things happened or these people were killed or these children were killed. I mean, we just have to look at what's happening in the Ukraine today. And some people just will say, well, you know, where is God? But you know what, you really have to read the Bible because the Bible says that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. You see, the human race has been made in the image and likeness of God, and we were meant to represent God, meant to be agents to run this whole planet for His glory. But you know what? We turned away, and we went away from God, and we chose not to. And so the whole world lies in His power. But Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. He came as a warrior. He came to deal with this evil that troubles us because we're all made in this likeness and we all have a tendency to do this wrong kind of stuff. We're what the Bible calls children of disobedience because that's what we're like. Do you know what? I'm a pastor. I got three kids, all three children of disobedience. You know, I didn't make them that way, and I didn't make them any different, but you know what? I would go, when they were young, I would go to the church office, and I would study the Bible and pray. I would come home. Something would get broken. I would say, who broke that? They would say to me, I didn't do it. Next one would say, I didn't do it. Next one would say, I didn't do it. They were liars. (laughs) I would say to Mary, what are you teaching these kids while I'm at the office? They had to have their own experience of Jesus. Because there's something in the human race that makes us disobedient. We turned away and we brought evil on ourselves. And sometimes people get grossly into evil, and this poor woman got seven demons. But Jesus set her free. 
Jesus declares war. Even when Jesus was baptized, the story in the Bible says that when he was 30 years of age, he came to be baptized, and the Spirit of God descended upon him. And almost immediately, he went into a real confrontation with personalized evil, and it tried to tempt him, and it tried to drag him from, it, from his course. But he would have nothing to do with it. He overcame it. And that was the beginning of his battle. You know what? Jesus started this conflict. He came to set people free. And you know what he said? He says, if I, by the finger of God, can cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has broken upon you. In other words, what he was saying, listen, I've come to get rid of this evil in the human race. I have come to declare war on it. You know what? Jesus came to do that. He came to do this extraordinary thing. You know, we tend to think of Jesus as a moral teacher. You know, turn the other cheek, go the extra mile, love your enemies. And you know what? He had beautiful moral teaching. Absolutely. But we can't miss this point. He came as a warrior. And he came to fight a battle. You know, a while ago on the radio, there was a rather pompous interviewer interviewing a minister. And he described the Bible, and he said, uh, he said these words. He said, the book of the Bible is simply a moral code. And the minister said, no, it isn't. And the interviewer said, I never thought I would hear a minister of religion say the Bible isn't a book of moral codes. Surely it is. And the minister said, no, you've completely missed the point. The Bible is a story of how God interrupted, broke through, and gave us salvation by his own power to set us free. And the interviewer said, well, oh, I didn't realize. I just thought it was, you know, just try and be good. Just try and do your best, and maybe you'll, like, get in, you know, kind of thing. No. It's about God intervening, and Jesus came to intervene. And so, you know, so, you know for Mary... Mary, she had this wonderful, wonderful privilege of having had her life transformed. What dominated her before she was now free from, and she'd run out of that tomb into a glorious freedom already, fully alive. And she started traveling around with Jesus. She started traveling around with Jesus and the apostles. She just wanted to be in their company. She just wanted to be around this glorious guy with the power to heal. And so Jesus went about healing people, blind people who couldn't see. He touched them, and then they could see. Extraordinary, amazing miracles. Guys who were lame, he would say, get up and walk, and they did. Deaf people who had never heard before heard something, and they heard the voice of Jesus for the first time. People who had never seen anything with their eyes they saw Jesus, and their world was changed. He came into their lives. I mean, it's an extraordinary thing just to say to a layman, hey, buddy, get up and walk. And the man says, well, you know what? That kind of is my problem. I just can't do that. But when Jesus says you can, you can do it. The man with the withered arm, Jesus said, stretch forth your arm and, G, and, G, and this guy's like, hey, don't be so unkind. That's something I can't do. No, no, stretch forth your arm. And he stretched forth, stretches forth his arm and says, wait, wait, I can do it. I can do it. You see, Jesus transformed lives. He was phenomenal. In fact, he was so popular with the crowds that they became huge. And sometimes he couldn't even enter into towns because the crowds got so huge. And there was one time where people were trying to get this lame guy, a guy who had been paralyzed, to see Jesus. So they cut a hole in the roof and they lowered him down so that Jesus could pray for him and bring healing to his life. Jesus was just the center of attention. And glory went out from him. So Jesus came as a great healer, but not only as a great healer. He came to set people free. And that is the Jesus that Mary knew. And because of Jesus, Mary knew what it meant to be fully alive. 
And so we come to this passage this morning, to that very morning when Jesus comes to the tomb. I mean, she is brokenhearted. She's crushed. She's confused. She's shattered. She just wants to be ne as near as possible. I mean, she is totally confused. She says, tell me where the body is. Well, what do you mean, Mary? You're going to take it away. A little woman like you, you're going to grab what? Grab the body and you're going to carry it off somewhere? She's just overwhelmed. And the body isn't there. The body's not there. She's amazed to find the tomb empty. And again, you see all these details. She runs and she tells the other disciples. And Peter returns. And John gets there first, but he doesn't go in. So then Peter comes and he goes in. These details, why bother to make these things up? Do you know what these details speak of? They speak of authenticity. This is what actually happened. They're really like this. So Peter and John, they go away, but Mary hangs around. And then she sees the sky. You know, she thinks he's a gardener. It's still dark. She arrived, the scripture says, when it was still dark. And she sees the sky, and she thinks he's the gardener. And she's going to speak to the gardener. But before that, do you know what the Bible says? It says that she stoops down, and she looks into the tomb. She stoops down, and she looks into the tomb. And you know what I'd like to do? I'd like to just stop here just for a moment. I want to pause for a moment. Because I am so thrilled that you are here this morning. I really am. And maybe you wouldn't call yourself a believer yet. Or maybe you're thinking it's Easter Sunday. Aren't we all Christians? Or maybe your partner, friend, or spouse said, come on, you know, let's go. Let's get a free breakfast at Milton Bible Church. And you said, okay, I'll come. But you're not necessarily taking this very seriously yet. I want to appeal to you with all of my heart. Please don't miss this. It's the biggest news the world has ever known. This woman, she stooped and she looked in. Let me ask you a question. Have you done that? Have you done that yet? You say, oh yeah, I know all about this. No, no. What do you know really? You see this woman, she stooped down. She took the time. You need to think about that. Look into this. It's the biggest thing in world history. This is going to affect all of life and death. So for goodness sake, look into it. And then she asked, is that the gardener? And then she hears these amazing words, or this amazing word. Do you know what she heard? Mary. He calls her name. That's his voice. It's his voice. Master, Rabboni. <laughs> Lord. It says, you know, elsewhere that they couldn't believe it for, for, for the joy they had. I mean, she is completely blown away. Do you know what? I remember when I gave my life to Jesus Christ. I came to the realization that the story of Easter was true and that I was forced to make a decision. What would I do with this truth? Would I accept it? Or would I reject it? And, and, or, or would I ask Jesus to be my Lord and Savior? Would I choose to follow him? And you know what? That was like over 40 years ago. And you know, in that moment, when I placed my faith in Jesus, something happened. I suddenly knew he is alive. And I've known it ever since. He's alive. And to my surprise, being a sarcastic, cynical 19-year-old, I knelt down beside my bed in my room in my parents' house, and I prayed a prayer to receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I said, I'm so sorry, Lord, for the life I've lived. Thank you. I never understood that you died for me. I knew you died, but I didn't know why. You took my place. 
You took my sin upon yourself, and now I understand that you're alive. I can have you in my life. I can have God in my life. I never thought that was possible. I mean, you know, people wonder about God, but I can experience God. It was like he spoke my name, Jim. I didn't hear it audibly, but it was just as real. Like I said, that was over 40 years ago, and I've walked with him ever since. And I've heard him on many occasions, and he has transformed my life. He is so real. He is so wonderful. We need to stoop and look. You see, it's not blind faith. John writes in detail what happened. It wasn't a leap in the dark. It's looking into the light. There is nobody there. That tomb is empty. What I'd like to do now, uh, with your graciousness, I would like to do something that I only do at Easter and Christmas. And that, or, or usually that's whenever I do it, but what I'd like to do is for us as a group to pray what, what I call a prayer of salvation. A prayer of salvation. And I'd like us to all to say it out loud and all to, sit, sit, to say it together. And if you would like to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, even for the first time, or maybe even to affirm your salvation and your faith in Christ, I'm going to invite you to say it out loud with me. But as well, maybe you say, well, I've prayed this kind of prayer, and I do believe Jesus is my Savior. Well, I'm going to invite you to pray it too, to encourage the people around you. So we're going to pray this prayer, and we're going to do it like wedding vows, okay? I'm going to say a little bit, then you guys are going to repeat, all right? You guys ready? All right, let's encourage one another. So, Father, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus to bear my sin on the cross and to give his life for me. I believe in my heart that you raised Jesus from the dead. I receive Jesus as my Savior. I make, him more, I make him Lord of my life right now. Thank you for making me your child. Amen. If you've prayed that prayer or if, you know, for the first time or you just sense God's doing something in your heart even right now, I really want to follow this up. I don't want to let this go. I don't want to let this lie. So I want to invite you, if you have a desire, my wife and I are starting up a new group on Tuesday night. And it's a group in which we're going to study the Bible. We're going to talk about, you know, what Christ has done. And, and so if you're new to Christianity, I'd love for you to come to our home and to be a part of that. Or if you've been a Christian for a while and you, you're like, you know, I want to get into, you know, in, in, into the Christian faith, I think this study will be so beneficial to help you go deep in the things of God. And I just want to open that up to you because there's just so much for us. Just let us know because we'd love for you to come. Well, here in this passage, we find Mary Magdalene. She meets the risen Christ. So she comes, so Jesus comes up from death, and he says these wonderful words to her. And I'm going to close with these words, what Jesus says uh, to uh, Mary, because I think it's so cool. He says to Mary, go and tell my brothers. Like, go and tell my brothers what you've seen and heard. Now, go and tell my brothers. You may think that is not that significant, but it is significant because you know what? Jesus had never called the disciples, 
his brothers before. He had called them his disciples. At one point, he said, I even call you friend, but he had never up to this point ever called them brothers. But now, through his death and resurrection, he's incorporated us in. We are his brothers and sisters. We have new life. Do you know the Bible says that he came unto his own, and his own did not receive him. So in other words, the Pharisees said, yeah, I see him coming. I hear what he has to say. Get lost. We don't want to have anything to do with him. But the scripture goes on. It says he came to his own, and his own didn't receive him. But as many as did receive him, To them he gave the authority, the power to be called, to become the children of God. Listen, when you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, it's not like you're getting in by the skin of your teeth. You come in as sons and daughters. All of us. The beloved of God. Jesus said, when you pray, I want you to use the words, Father, Father. When we pray, say, Father. And you know what? To learn that I have a Father in heaven. I have a Savior who will never forsake me. When he said, it is finished, you know what happened? Your guilt was gone forever. We're righteous as a gift. It's awesome. It is an awesome thing what God has done for us in Jesus. Jesus has made a breath taking transformation in us. He endured the cross and he gave us life. He loves you today. He lived a stunning, stunning life. So let me just say it again. Don't let this pass by. Don't come this close. I appeal to you, don't come come this close in church hearing about salvation and what Christ has done and walk out and miss it. What a tragedy that would be. Come and find him for yourself. If you know him as Savior, you know what? It's time to celebrate. It's time to party. It's time to dance. It's time to sing. It's time for Barry DeGrucci and I, you know, maybe, oh, sorry, my cane fell over. It, maybe it's time for Barry DeGrucci and I to swing our canes. <laughs> like, it's party time because of what Christ has done. He lives. He lives. That tomb is empty. He has called your name, and you've run out of that grave, out of the darkness, into this glorious day. I'm going to ask the band to come. We're going to sing just a great Easter song in closing. Um, And while they do, I'm going to pray for you guys, all right? So let's pray together. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your presence here with us today. And I just sense that there are those that have been very sensitive to your word and to your message and to the love that you have for them right now and the love that you demonstrated through the resurrection. Thank you that we can sing about your kindness to us and about your love for us. And Father, I pray, I pray some of us here this morning will say, you know what, I just really need to know. I just really need to settle this for myself got to reach out today. I'd be foolish to walk away from this place and not have this confirmed in my life. Father, we celebrate the victory of the cross today. We celebrate the victory of the Lord Jesus Christ for us. Lord, please have your way in our hearts, we ask. We pray this in Jesus' name. Who could carry that kind?